Hey ladies, happy, what's today? July something? <laughs> happy summer. Um, and welcome back to our Bible study. I just went out of the bedroom and got a drink or something and told the kids, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my video now for the ladies Sunday Bible study, the Sunday school class. And um, they were like, you haven't done it yet? Because I actually told them a while ago I was coming in here. <laughs> And I told them, no, I, um, I went in there to do it, but then I had to clean my room because I didn't want to be, I didn't want it to be too realistic in the background for anyone. <laughs> so, um, like that corner of my bed, it's totally made, the whole bed is totally made, but it didn't look, I don't know. I just needed to do some cleaning up to feel better about recording a video in here. <laughs> so anyway, um, we are just gonna jump right in. We are moving through our steps through the Bible. I'm sure I've mentioned all of the steps already to you at one point or another, but um, I think I'm gonna show them all today just because we haven't really looked at it all like as one thing. And I should have planned ahead better for this because this paper is gonna be kind of see-through, but we'll see. So the beginning is the first one, and we talked about creation, Adam and Eve, the fall, Noah's Ark, and the Tower of Babel. We're on the patriarchs, and we've talked about the call of Abram, and Abram's name being changed to Abraham. Today we're going to hit these two, um, and kind of touch on this a little bit. But um, the other main steps, I'll just go down through them, Exodus and the Promised Land, the Kingdom and the Prophets, the Messiah, and the letters. So those are the six steps that we're going through. And I feel like we kind of um, stalled out. I don't, I don't mean to say stalled out because we were doing stuff, but we kind of parked for a while. That's what I'm trying to say, not stalling, parking. Those are different. <laughs> we parked for a while in one section and we um, have been taking a while getting through this whole life of Abraham kind of thing and his family in the patriarchs. Oops, now I'm throwing things on the floor. But um, it's because they're so foundational to a lot of stuff. And so today we're going to move, the, pick up the pace a little bit. And I think that moving ahead, you'll find that it goes a little bit faster than it has been going the past few weeks. Um, maybe that hasn't bothered you at all. Maybe you felt like it was dragging, depending, you know, on how your perspective or how much you know, how familiar you are with the stories. But I do think that we're going to start picking up the pace from now on. So we left off last week talking about Jacob um, and his encounter with God where they are wrestling and Jacob isn't losing, I guess is the way I can think of to say it. Um, and God renamed him Israel, um, a prince with God, the one who has fought with God and has prevailed. He has strength, he has power. Um, and his new name is not the deceiver or the supplanter, the one who wrongfully takes the place of another, but Israel, a prince with God. So um, we know that at that point last week, we were talking about how he was on his way to meet his brother after many years. And um, he had sent groups on ahead of him, but now the time comes for them to go ahead and actually meet face to face. You can only delay so long when you have something coming up, right? You can procrastinate. I'm a good procrastinator. <laughs> Just ask my husband. He will confirm because it drives him crazy. <laughs> but um, you can only procrastinate for so long. And so finally, Jacob and Esau have to meet face to face. And we're in Genesis 33 verses. Well, it's kind of talks about it in verses one through four. But um, I'll just read in, chap in verse 2, the Bible says, He put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. That's a little bit unexpected when you, the last time you heard from this man, he was vowing to kill you <laughs> and now you see that um, their meeting is very emotional very tearful very happy um, I don't know if happy is the word I'm looking for but it he was glad to meet him he hugged him and he welcomed him 
Um, so we're taking a little bit of a break here to mention the route that they've been traveling. I've got a little map here in my book. So I'm gonna hold it up here. So Jacob has been up in Haran, which is up here. It doesn't really show on our map. It's up here somewhere <laughs> with Laban. That's where Laban lived and where he got married and had all these kids with a variety of wives and concubines. Um, and he's coming down this way. He gets to Penuel. That's the name of the place where he wrestled with God. He comes across to Shechem. Um, and I believe this is where he meets his brother, Esau. And next, God tells him to go to Bethel, which is down here. And I don't know if you remember when that place was named, uh, but Jacob named Bethel, house of God, Bethel. And he um, named it when he was going the opposite direction, fleeing from his brother. And he got to this point, Bethel, and had a vision of the ladder ascending up into heaven and angels ascending and descending and um, God speaking to him. So that is where God sends him now. So they're obeying, they're moving along, God's sending him, the whole group is going. They are leaving Bethel now and going to Ephrath, which is also known as Bethlehem. And you may recognize that name because other places in the Old Testament refer to it as Bethlehem Ephrata. Do you remember that from the prophecies? And thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the princes of Judah, something like that. This is the Bethlehem where Jesus would be born many, many years down the road. But they're heading to Bethlehem and something happens, something life-changing and dramatic. This is recorded in Genesis 35, verses 16 to 20. The Bible says, And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Wait a minute, we didn't realize Rachel was pregnant again. She is. Um, and it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And I mentioned Ephrath and Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. So um, Rachel, the one who couldn't have children, ended up having Joseph. And now she is able to have another son. But sadly, she dies in childbirth. And um, I can't imagine that. They're, I mean, they're on the road. Giving birth in a normal situation is hard enough, but giving birth while you're like a wandering, I don't know if they were necessarily wandering, but they were traveling while you're traveling has to be a whole nother story altogether. And she doesn't survive the experience, but the little boy is born um, and he ends up being named Benjamin. Um, so we're just going to take a quick break here and talk about all of these children that have been born. We have a list. If you have this book, it has a place, <clears throat> there's a glare, I'm trying to not get the glare down here. And also on the next page, this is pages 53 and 54, where you can fill these in just to kind of see Leah's sons, Rachel's sons, Bilhah's sons, this is Rachel's maidservant, and Zilpah's sons, that's Leah's maidservant. So Leah's sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, we mentioned those four already because we talked about Leah's commentary on their names that she gave and how that kind of seemed to show uh, a journey for her that she was passing through. And then also Issachar and Zebulun. Rachel's sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Bilhah's sons, Dan and Naphtali. And Zilpah's sons, Gad and Asher. And these are listed out for you in Genesis 35, which is right where we're at, verses 24 through 26. And it says, they were born unto him in Paddan Aram. This is another name for Haran, where he lived with Laban and all the people up there. So you may have noticed six sons for Leah, and then two each for Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. That gives you 12 sons. <laughs> These are the 12 children of Jacob. And we also call them the 12 tribes of Israel, 
wait, Israel, I've heard that name before. Oh yeah, Jacob's name has been changed to Israel. <laughs> Um, so it kind of makes sense how it, how it all came to be that they're the 12 tribes They're the 12 sons of Israel the man called Israel um, and so You may notice if you're paying attention and reading names carefully at some time as you're reading through the new the Old Testament that there's a list of the 12 tribes and You might think wait a minute. I've never seen Joseph listed or I don't see him in this list. What about hmm, this is weird I don't see Levi listed either. What's going on here? Well, the list can vary, and there are a couple reasons for that. It depends on what exactly they're listing, but these were his 12 children. Um, as far as the tribes go, as time passes and they become whole tribes of people, these men were the fathers or the founders of these tribes, but um, Levi's tribe does not receive an inheritance of land when down the road they enter the promised land because the tribe of Levi is assigned to be the priests. and God said that their inheritance was him. It was God. It was not land. And so they get some other stuff. They get some provisions made for them, but they don't actually get a portion of land like the other tribes get. Uh, and so if you're listing tribes that get land, you're not going to see Levi because Levi didn't get land. Um, and then you might think, well, that's only 11. Well, remember Joseph my dogs are barking outside the window now. I don't know if the sound is catching that, but those are dogs, if you hear it. <laughs> um, Joseph, Jacob's favorite. Joseph is not listed in any of the down the road, these kind of divisions of tribes. Um, and it's not because he wasn't special, because if you remember, he was actually the favorite son, so he was special. He actually apparently was special enough that he got a double portion because he has two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, in Egypt. And those two sons each get their own portion. So Joseph kind of gets double because it's not counted as Joseph, it's counted as Manasseh and Ephraim. So if you see a different kind of a list, it just depends on what it is exactly they're listing. Are they listing groups of people who got land? Are they listing sons? Are they listing, you know, tribes? Because kind of, there's 13 tribes according to some countings, you know, if you count Manasseh, Ephraim, and Levi. So it just depends. The lists can vary, and this is why. Okay, moving on. Joseph. So we know that Joseph was the favorite. Um, Joseph is the, what number did he come? I think maybe seven? No, I don't, I'm not going to guess because I can't remember. He's down the list somewhere. <laughs> He's not the firstborn and he's not the secondborn. He's all not, whatever, he's not near the top of the list. <laughs> but he's the favorite because he is the first son that Rachel gave to Jacob. So parents all know that it can be hard to make siblings all feel equally loved, no matter how hard you try and no matter how good of a job you think you're doing, children will always believe that somebody is being treated better than them or that one sibling is the favorite or whatever. I'm sure that they probably have valid, you know, <laughs> feelings and valid reasons behind that, but it's hard to get kids to really believe that everyone's being treated equally. Well, in this family, it seems like they didn't even try that hard to make everybody feel equal because Joseph was the obvious favorite. Um, kind of a dangerous thing to do, especially in a, I don't know, big old family of big old boys. <laughs> but um, Joseph gets a striped coat, a, a coat that elevates him to them in their culture. This colorful coat was not a working coat. It was a coat of somebody who didn't need to work and they were all working and um, anyway, they hate him. They take advantage of the opportunity that comes. They kidnap him. They throw him down in an old well to die. They end up changing their mind and they say, no, no, let's not leave him there. Let's actually sell him to these Ishmaelites who happened to be passing where they were will sell him as a slave. Um, Ishmaelites, where have I heard that name? Ishmael, oh right, Abram's son with Hagar. These are descendants of that person. Um, already a little bit of, you know, stuff going on between these two families. So they sell him off to the Ishmaelites and they take his famous striped coat or his coat of many colors and they dip it in blood of a goat or something and they tell Jacob, that Joseph must have been killed by a wild animal. We found his coat all bloody and torn. 
Jacob believes it, of course, he's horrified, he's grieving, he goes into mourning, and Joseph ends up with this tribe of Ishmaelites making it to Egypt. He's bought by Potiphar, who is fairly high up in the land. He does very well. He rises to the top of Potiphar's household for whatever reason, his character, I guess. Um, and then Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him of raping her and he's thrown into prison. In prison, he rises to the top of the prisoners based on his character, I guess. There was something different about him. He ends up interpreting some dreams for a couple different people. His dreams, his interpretations of the dreams come true. He ends up being called to Pharaoh to interpret a dream of Pharaoh's and Pharaoh puts him in charge of the kingdom, second in command of all of Egypt. Um, what a roller coaster. Of course, this is not all taking place in a week or a month or even a year. It's taking place over many years. But um, wherever Joseph finds himself, something about him, something about who he is or his character or the God he serves, maybe, <laughs> um, causes him to rise to the top. And this dream for Pharaoh that he interprets was a prediction of famine that was coming. And so Egypt was able to prepare based on Joseph's leadership. And so Egypt, when the famine hit, Egypt had plenty of food because they had been saving ahead, but the other surrounding areas did not, including Canaan. Canaan did not have enough food and that is where Joseph came from. So um, according to Genesis 42 verses six through eight, let me read this quickly. The Bible says Joseph was the governor over the land and he it was that sold to all the people of the land and Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth and Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them but made himself strange unto them and spake roughly unto them and he said unto them whence come ye and they said from the land of Canaan to buy food and Joseph knew his brethren but they knew not him. So they end up coming to Egypt to buy food because everybody around there knows Egypt has food. You can go there and buy. They have plenty of food. His, his brothers show up and he knows them. And a lot of details happen in this story. We do not have time to talk about all the details, but they don't have Benjamin with them. It's just the 10 of them. And he says, oh, do you have any other brothers? Obviously he knows the answer, but they say, yes, we have another, our youngest but he has to stay at home with our father. Our father would die if anything happened to the youngest. And Joseph ends up telling them, um, well, you can't come back unless you bring your youngest brother. What is he thinking? Is he thinking he wants to make sure that everything's all right? Or does he really just want to see his brother? We don't really know, but he tells them, don't bother coming back unless you bring that youngest brother with you. Time passes. Of course, they run out of food. They manage to convince Jacob to let them bring Benjamin back with them. And they do come. And in Genesis 45, we see what happens when Joseph sees them. I'm sorry, Genesis 43, verses 26 through 31. Hmm. Talking about Joseph. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep. And he entered into his chamber and wept there. So kind of funny wording, his bowels yearned upon his brother. This is nothing weird, nothing inappropriate. <laughs> We're just talking about an old way of saying that he felt it deep in here, right? Um, we might talk about feeling it in your gut or deep in your heart. Uh, a long time ago they talked about your bowels and it may not have been scientifically accurate in the same way that feeling something in your gut may not be scientifically accurate it has nothing to do with your stomach and your intestines really but um, that's how they expressed it in these days so man it really got him <laughs> when he saw his full brother his only full brother the other ones were half brothers with Joseph um, they had different mothers but he saw Benjamin and he couldn't take it. He had to run out and cry. And then he fixed himself all up, came back in, and he ends up revealing himself to them in chapter 35. And um, just a couple things that I noticed about this chapter. 
we see this again at the end of the book of Genesis, but in verse 8 of Genesis 45, as he's giving a speech to them, revealing himself, he says, So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Um, that first phrase, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. Was it them? Yes, it was. But ultimately, they could plan what they want and do what they wanted. It was God. And I feel like this is a such a helpful and life-changing perspective if we can get a hold of this, if I can get a hold of this, with things happen in my life, even when people do me wrong, can I say, they're not doing it, God is doing this, and God is planning something and working something out that I don't have a clue. And it may not be for years and years and years that it all comes out. And honestly, I might never see it. But can I believe that God is doing it? And that they could do nothing to me if God wasn't letting them do it. Um, that's hard. I feel like that's hard. But that's what Joseph expresses here. I also think it's interesting that he mentioned God has made me a father to Pharaoh. I feel like when I picture this scene, I don't picture Joseph as being older than Pharaoh. <laughs> but apparently, that was how it was. It was a younger Pharaoh. Um, and then also, at the, toward the end, verses 16 through 18, talk about Pharaoh being happy when he heard that Joseph's family had come. And he was welcoming them and wanting him to bring them all. I just think that's kind of sweet, their relationship that they had. Um, I don't know. You know, he, he had a gr apparently they were buddies. Joseph and Pharaoh, you know? <laughs> I don't know. But Pharaoh was happy and wanted Joseph's family to come. Um, so they end up, you know, takes a long time, a lot of doing to move that big of a group, but they wind up in Egypt. Jacob and Joseph are finally reunited because Jacob hasn't been along for any of these trips. Um, Pharaoh blesses Jacob. They're given a place to live. They're given, you know, provision. They're cared for. Finally, in Genesis 47, we hear it's finally, Jacob is finally dying, and he gives his dying request not to be buried in Egypt. He wants to be buried in his homeland of Canaan. And in specific, they have a cave that was purchased uh, when Sarah died, I believe. And um, Abraham and Sarah are both buried there. Isaac and Rebecca are both buried there. Leah is buried there. Rachel is not buried there, as you remember, she was buried on the road between Bethel and Bethlehem, I believe, right? And um, Jacob asked to be buried there too, in the family burial plot, basically. That was his dying wish, and they promise him that they'll do it. Um, of course, once Jacob is dead, the brothers start to think, yee, probably Joseph was just being nice to us because our dad was around, but now, He's gonna get us. Um, Joseph reassures them in Genesis 50 that that's not the case. He says, am I in the place of God? I'm, it's not my job to make things right. Um, what verses are this? What verses are these? Right, Genesis 50, 19 and 20, he says, fear not for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. He recognized that God had a plan. And regardless of what the brothers may have intended or thought in their hearts, all the evil that was there, he didn't deny that it was evil. Um, but he said, you know what? God worked it out. God did something. God orchestrated all of this. And I'm not going to try to take revenge. You know, this is God's deal. He can deal with it. Um, and I just think it's so interesting. The very end verse 26 finally coming to the death of joseph the bible tells us so joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in egypt uh joseph was a mummy guys <laughs> i don't know why that's so fascinating to me and honestly did they do mummies only for the pharaohs he was second in command he was not technically a pharaoh but he was up there I feel like he's a mummy. I feel like we could find him. Maybe they already found him and they didn't know it was Joseph. I don't know. It's just so intriguing to me. I love Egyptian history. It's always been fascinating, even when I was a little girl. Go to the museum and see the mummies and stuff. Um, I don't like the mummy movies. Pause. I don't like scary and gross, creepy stuff, but just the, the fact, apparently, that it seems like 
Joseph was made into a mummy. That's cool, okay? So <laughs> um, we close out this chapter with a little family tree, which I have filled in in my book. This is page 58, if you have the book. And it just goes through, we have, I gotta come up here so I can see. Abraham and Sarah, their son was Isaac. Ishmael is not on this chart. Ishmael would be over here with his own line. Um, but we've got Isaac who marries Rebecca. Rebecca and Isaac have Jacob and Esau. Uh, it doesn't also mention Esau's line, although there's a whole other line from Esau. But Jacob marries Leah and he marries Rachel. And he also has kids with Zilpah and Bilhah. And so all the kids are listed out here. Um, Joseph is and Judah are the blanks that were left to be filled in. And then Joseph marries Asenath in Egypt. We didn't talk about that, but that's who he married. And they have Manasseh and Ephraim. That's his two sons that we mentioned. So a little quick family tree. Um, if you are into history, you might want to look up the Hyksos people. I'm not going to go into it. They were a Semitic people who may very well be historically in this story. They may even have been um, in power in Egypt when all of this went down. There are different opinions on when Joseph exactly, when in history exactly he was in Egypt and when all this happened, but it may or may not have been this fellow Semitic group of people, the Hyksos, who were in power there. Um, and then when you see in the book of Exodus that there was a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, it may be that that it was after the end of the Hyksos reign and so it was a totally new government and so it would have been actually a Hamitic family. We talked about Shem, Ham, and Japheth, so Semitic people, which includes the Hebrews, the Arabs, and a lot of other people, um, are different from the Hamitic people, which is what the nation of Africa would typically be. So. Just cool history. These are real people. They can really be found in history, um, whether it's specifically this Hyksos nation or not, which is in, in charge in Egypt at this time. We'll find out for sure when we get to heaven. But it's interesting to study and look at possibilities. All right, um, we'll be back next week. We will be talking about Exodus. So we will be um, into our third, our third big section. I'll have to move down my little pink slidey thing. But we finished the patriarchs, so I'm just gonna quickly review those quickly. I already slid it down. But we have the call of Abram. Abram's name changed to Abraham. The 12 tribes of Israel, Joseph sold into slavery, and Jacob's family arrives in Egypt. That's what these pyramids are. So, hope you guys have a great week, and I will see you next time. Talk to you later.